today on an encouraging Fixing the Money thing. Let me say it again. How much of God's estate do you have access to? All of it. Inheritance isn't something you work for. It's not something you apply for or beg for. Inheritance is defined as a hereditary succession to an estate or title, the right of an heir to succeed property, something that may be legally transmitted to an heir. Today on Fixing the Money Thing, Gary Cassie uncovers the truth about your identity. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. And reveals exactly how much you're entitled to. Let me say it again. How much of God's estate do you have access to? All of it. How many would think that is a pretty good inheritance? Is there an inheritance possibly bigger than that anywhere possibly in life? I don't think so. Today, walk in your kingdom inheritance, live your birthright, and fix your money thing. We've been talking about inheritance, right? And uh, how many would like to receive an inheritance? We asked this last week. Well, of course, we all would. But unfortunately, 50% of people in the United States do not leave an inheritance. They leave only bills. And that's something, 50%. 73% of Americans die in debt with an average debt outstanding of about $65,000. So things aren't going well compared to what God says. The godly and righteous person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. That means you've got plenty for yourself, passed down to your kids and their kids. This is the inheritance of the righteous. Amen? Are you God's children? Well, this is your inheritance. Now, we're going to take a few moments and talk about inheritance, but first off, let's detox some of the Hollywood and some of the glamour we see out there of what they call important. You know, it's amazing. I talked about people being in debt. Some of the most high-profile people in the, in, in the world, Hollywood, uh, you think they make millions, they do, but they spend it, and they don't leave an inheritance. Michael Jackson left $500 million in debt. And, of course, we think he's very uh, successful, which he was, but uh, he wasn't successful in every arena, that's for sure. $500 million in debt. But uh, Marvin Gaye, Motown, famous for Motown music, $9 million in debt. Judy Garland, uh, R- Mickey Rooney, remember some of those movies, the old black and whites, uh, both retired, both uh, in no inheritance and millions of dollars in debt. Sammy Davis Jr., millions of dollars in debt. Whitney Houston broke, totally broke. Uh, Andy Gibb, uh, millions of dollars in debt. I mean, uh, it just... Don't let the glitter kind of move you, friend. Uh, You know, it doesn't matter who they are. They're all going to pass on. We're all going to heaven someday. And uh, the Bible says that the righteous person leaves an inheritance. So what you do in this life makes a difference. And God says it's good. It's going to be good for you. It's going to be good. All right. So let's jump into that right now. Inheritance. The word inheritance means, of course, passing on assets uh, to heirs. And we talked last week, do a brief review here of uh, the last will and testament. We talked about what that meant. A last will and testament is a legal document which allows you to control how your estate will be handled after you go to heaven. All right. And the word testament is very important here. We talked about that word last week. It is a formal written directive providing for the distribution of one's property after death. So this is called the old and new Testament, this is the will. You want to know what God's will is? You ever heard that phrase, what's God's will? This is his will. This is his testament. This is your inheritance. All right, if I came to your door with a a signed certified letter stating your Uncle Ralph left you uh, an inheritance, would you open it? Yes, you would. I hope so. Galatians chapter 4, just a brief review, a couple of scriptures I believe are important for the foundation of this, this topic. Again, we're going to go through this again. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse number 1 says, what I'm saying, now Paul is talking to the church there because the Christians are, are being born again, but they still want to hold to the Jewish culture and demand circumcision and other things they did under the law. And so Paul is saying, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he's no different from a slave. Although he, what? We said last week your Bible should have this underlined. What? Although they own what? How much? 
the whole estate, right. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we are underage, we are in slavery under the elemental spiritual principles of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Remember, slaves don't have an inheritance, only sons and daughters, right? Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir of what? The whole estate. How much of the estate? Okay, whose estate? We got to talk about, okay, whose estate? We'll find out. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Again, this is review. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of who? Heirs of God. What of God? His estate. How much of God's estate? Let me say it again. How much of God's estate do you have? have access to all of it, God's estate, all right? If Uncle Ralph had no, nothing, you know, you might get a few trinkets. You know, you might get that inheritance in the mail and you go, oh, it's Uncle Ralph's estate. We know not having to bother opening that, right? But if God says he's leaving you his estate, I think you'd open it, yeah. okay? And it says you're a co-heir with Christ. Now, we talked about this very important last week. The word in the Greek for co-heir means that it is a participant in common, meaning that as we think of heirs or inheritances, we divide it among the siblings. That's not true in this case. You are in common, which means everyone has equal claim on the entire estate. Yeah. So for instance, again, reviewing uh, to a husband and wife own property, they will own it tenants in common which means that they both own it. If one passes away, no probate is needed. Probate is the legal process which verifies the legal claim on an estate. So meaning that if one of those people dies, nothing changes, they already own it. Does that make sense? They already own it. So stop trying to convince God that he needs to do something for you. So many people try to convince God. Well, God, you know I do this. You try to convince him to he him hearing you to make a claim on his estate. Friend, you already own it, so stop your begging, your whining, your crying, because that is unbelief. That's not faith. You don't know who you are. You're acting like an orphan. You're acting like an orphan who has no home, no inheritance, no legal claim, but you are not an orphan. You are a son and daughter of the living God, and he has given you access, and his inheritance is already yours, all right? Already yours. Now, today we're going to talk about what inheritance, okay? We just said it's God's inheritance, but someone needs to help me understand what that means. What is God's inheritance? To help you get an idea, we're going to talk about the blessing of Abraham. You remember who Abraham was back in Genesis, right? He, rem he was called Abram, Abram first, and he believed God. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the Bible says the blessing of Abraham. First off, let me review, are the patriarchs, were they broke or wealthy? wealthy. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, were they all wealthy? They're all, they're all very wealthy, all right? Now, let's talk about the blessing of Abraham. Now you have the blessing of Abraham, but Abraham was not born again. So his blessing was earthbound. It speaks primarily of the earth and uh, taking dominion in the earth realm as far as uh, prospering in the earth realm. But you have, of course, the born again experience. You not only have the blessing of Abraham, you are part of God's family and so that changes things. We'll talk more about that next week. But I want to spend some time on the blessing of Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, we read these words. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So that by faith we might receive the promise 
of the Spirit. What's that talking about? Jesus came through Abraham's lineage. And through Jesus, we inherited the legal adoption as children of God. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So through Abraham, we were able to receive the Spirit, right? You got it? Okay. Now, the blessing given to Abraham. In the time of the patriarchs, you'll see them lay their hand on their kids, and they'll speak over them. In that day and age, that was similar to a testament. It had, um, it had profound effect, binding effect uh, on that child and spoke also prophetically of them. But it was almost like a testament. When that dad spoke over them, it was like this is what, it, it had a binding effect. It was the will and testament, so to speak, of the dad laying his hand on that child and speaking the will, basically, over that child. Now, the blessing of Abraham is the promises that God gave Abraham. The promises. More on your kingdom inheritance from Gary Cassie right after this. The Lord will grant you what? Enough money to pay your car payment and just barely survive, buy some crackers and cheese for lunch. Listen, I don't care where you're at, where you're starting at. I want to talk about where you're headed. Discover your wealth and apply your inheritance with Gary Cassis, Claiming Your Kingdom Inheritance, a six-part teaching that will open your mind to possibilities greater than you can think, ask, or imagine. And it's not based on what you did today or yesterday. It's based on what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Don't hesitate to claim what's yours. Call, write, or visit GaryCassis.com today to release prosperity and abundance in your life. Claim Your Kingdom Inheritance dives deep into the foundations of your identity to show you your worth as an heir of heaven. You are precious, you are loved, and you are meant to prosper. Let's return to Faith Life Church in New Albany, Ohio for more Inheritance Insight. All right, so in Genesis chapter 12, verse number one, the Lord says to Abram, which was his name before God changed it, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I'll show you. I will make you into a great nation. Stop everything because you should have stopped everything by now if you heard what he just said. Adam and Eve sinned, rebelled, committed treason, kicked God out of the earth realm, right? Okay. Now, remember the result of that was God said, now through your own painful toil and sweat, you have to survive in life. Do you see something different here? I will make you. That's God speaking. I will make you great. I will make you great. Big, big change because Abraham believed God. So I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. The word bless means sanctified, consecrated, or separated. So there's going to be a separation. There's going to be a division. You're going to see changes. I will bless you and make your name great. Your name is going to be so great. It's going to be separated above, from other names. Your name is going to stand out. It's going to be great. I'm going to bless you. All right? You'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Again, this is talking about Jesus coming through the lineage of Abraham. I've said this before, but many people join us. Jesus had to come through the lineage of Abraham, which is why Matthew, the first chapter, is all of the begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, a boring chapter, unless you're Satan. Because it proves spiritually, legally, that Jesus came through the lineage and had a rightful legal avenue to do so. All right, so it had to, he had to come through uh, Abraham, which this is why all peoples on earth will be blessed through you because Jesus is coming through Abraham's promise. Now, that's the blessing. Abraham, of course, didn't have an idea really what he was saying. At the time God spoke that, he didn't have any kids. In fact, Sarah and he could not have kids. They were way too old. Yet God says, I'm going to make your name great. You know, you're going to take, you're going to be nations and all this stuff. So Abraham's asking for some clarification on some of this. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, God took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. 
See, God had to change the picture that he saw. He needed to see the promise in his mind. He needed to see at this point in time when God said this to him, he didn't have, Isaac wasn't here yet. But he said, Abraham, you're going to have so many heirs, you can't even count them. How many would realize that's a pretty big difference from not having the possibility of having an heir to having an heirs? All right. Abram believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, to take possession of it. And it is 36 or 35 million 840,000 acres. If you read the Bible, it defines the parameters and the boundaries of the property, the land he was going to give to Abraham. Now, when he said that, Abraham said back to him in verse number eight, Lord, how can I know that I'll gain possession of it? Remember, he's a nomad, doesn't have any kids, and here's 35 million acres. You know, how how do I know I'm going to have the ability to take possession of this? And so God made covenant with him in Genesis chapter 15. Now notice, the promise is the blessing. You got it? The promise is the blessing. But to verify the blessing, God made covenant and made a legal agreement which verified and gave more clarity and enforcement to the blessing. Does that make sense? So God spoke the blessing, then they legally came into agreement of the blessing. All right. Now, later, of course, you know the history of of the nation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you know, they were leaving Egypt. Now, you know, I, I kind of skimmed quite a few years into the future, but now they, uh, they have the blessing, uh, but they're in slavery because of their sin. God is now leading them out of Egypt, and of course, they couldn't enter because of unbelief, but God wanted to make sure when they were heading towards that promised land that they had a proper picture of what was ahead of them, Deuteronomy chapter 6 Verse 10, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers. Swore to your fathers, what is that? Did we not just read that? The covenant, the promise, the blessing, right? To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you, do you receive an inheritance or work for it? To give you, to give you, to give you, to give you, to give you. A land, and I want you to pay close attention to the adjectives. A land, in fact, you can help me, with what? Large, flourishing cities that you did not labor for. No painful toil and sweat. Houses, pick it up here, filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells, you did not dig. Vineyards and olive groves, you did not plant. And when you eat and are what? Satisfied. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Why did God put adjectives with those topics? Because he's painting a picture for them of their inheritance, their future. I am going to give you this. No labor attached. You're not going to do it in your own strength. I am making this happen. I will make you. Remember, I will make you. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 8, we're going to dig into this. Now, we are reading, this is the blessing of Abraham. What we're reading right now are the promises given to Abraham concerning his future. And so, we just read that the Gentiles have been grafted into that same blessing, right? Through Jesus Christ, that's you. So, as I read this, I want you to remember, this is talking about you. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 10. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, laws, and decrees. Now, again, in the Old Testament, their righteousness was defined by their acts of obedience under the law. We are, ours are not. Ours is by faith in the sacrifice Jesus made for us. So when it starts talking about commands, laws, decrees, all those types of things, uh, I want to make sure you understand it's not going, I'm not encouraging you to go back to to the legally uh, earning your righteousness. But by faith in Jesus, you inherit, already inherited this. Otherwise, when you eat and are, help me out now, when I stop, you say, when you eat and are 
satisfied. When you build what kind of houses? Fine houses. And settle down. When your herds and flocks grow large, this is an agricultural society. That was their prosperity. Grow large and your silver and gold increase. And all you have multiplies. All you have multiplies. Then your heart will become proud and you might forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Dropping down to verse 17. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So because of Abraham's covenant, the blessing, you have an anointing to prosper. The Jews still have this. You know, you've heard the Jewish people are wealthy, business-minded people. They still have this. They don't have the new birth but they still have the, the lineage, they still have the, the blessing of Abraham, unless they're just totally you know, ungodly, right? But the bottom line, they still have a legal claim on this. All right. I like this. But remember the Lord your God, who is, it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to, her, to your forefathers. Now, you know what that's talking about. He swore, made covenant with Abraham, right? Now, I have heard this scripture interpreted so many times that he'll give you the power to get wealth to help spread his covenant, to proclaim his covenant. Anyone else ever heard it interpreted that way? I have all the time. Most of the time, that's usually how I always hear it interpreted. Let's read it very carefully, though. It is to give you the ability to produce wealth and what? The fact you have the ability to produce wealth confirms his covenant. Confirms his covenant confirms his covenant, confirms his covenant, confirms his covenant, confirms his covenant. Now, the enemy has tried to steal your inheritance since day one. He's convinced the church that it's ungodly to have money. A vow of poverty is viewed as righteous. People are suspect if someone has something nice. In fact, the Bible talks about in um, Isaiah 61, it says, your shame shall be replaced with a double portion, right? But we're ashamed of God's blessings. Well, and I said last week, well, you know, that's a beautiful dress. So this old thing, I picked this up at the Goodwill for 10 cents. Why did you say that? Because you have a natural built-in shame to prosper. The church has taught you that it's wrong to prosper and you should be ashamed to prosper. Friend, you shouldn't be ashamed to prosper. It is confirmation of God's inheritance in your life. You have the anointing to prosper.